Welcome to April Biz Bits, WSCC. We are here. I sound like a broadcaster, I think. <laughs> Get on your radio voice. Radio voice. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, good morning. I thought what we would start, because we have our very special guest today, Miss Rhonda Gray with Insperity. Um, and before I introduce her, she's going to be talking about diversity in business. Um, but I just like to go through everyone that I see on the screen. And you just give us your one word, your state of mind. If you had to sum it all up right now with one word, an adjective that describes where's my head, what would that one word be? So, Miss Bell, you are first on my screen. If you had to sum it up, what would you say your one word this morning? Where's your state of mind? To be resilient. There's been a lot going on, so resilience. Resilience. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Miss Lisa? I would say encouraged. 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 All right. Lisa Z. I'm going to say my brain is full right now. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Here. Thank you. Catherine. Well, kind of going along with Lisa's busy. <laughs> busy. Just All busy. Right. Getting Excellent. things ready. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Rhonda, what's your one word? Uh, I would say it had to be focused. I leave for vacation Sunday. And you know, the week <laughs> before vacation is the busiest week. So I am focused on everything I need to do. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Catherine S., what's your one word? Where's your state of mind? I am with Rhonda. I am focused. Um, and that is only so that I do not drown in this mound of paperwork. So <laughs> laser focus. Excellent. Excellent. And D. Elaine, what's your one I word? Would, I would say I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment. Overwhelmed. Oh. Okay. All right. I always like to um, get one word when we're starting out things like this, just to kind of help one another throughout the next 30 minutes when we're together. So if there's a word that resonated with you, um, help first, reach out, see what we can do to help um, get those words um, where they need to be, um, offering our assistance in any way. So my one word is scattered because I am scattered. <laughs> 2020 taxes all around my desk this morning. So Shay, Shay, you can borrow some of my focus. So you okay. Can... <laughs> well, how, how about I borrow that now when I introduce <laughs> you? Okay, I am focused. I am going to introduce Miss Rhonda Gray, trusted colleague and partner of mine. She's a Ooh. business performance advisor with Insperity. And prior to joining Insperity, she was an executive search consultant with Collaborative Strategies. And Rhonda is also a former executive director of Almost Home, which is a local nonprofit which provides transitional housing for homeless teenage mothers and their children. She's also worked as a community investment manager at the United Way of Greater St. Louis and has served as a consultant with an organization that partnered with the St. Louis Public Schools to improve the quality of education for students in St. Louis City. Rhonda has been recognized for her extensive experience in nonprofit leadership, communications and marketing, and strategic planning. She frequently serves as a keynote speaker. Thank you for being here with us today. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Workshop facilitator and trainer for corporate academic and nonprofit organizations. Rhonda's insights about individual, social, and organizational change have have grown out of her years of working with organizations dedicated to education reform, literacy, and community, and workforce development. She's passionate about supporting work that elevates and uplifts African-American girls and women. She has served as a mentor and volunteers on several community and educational advisory boards. She is from St. Louis originally, obtained her bachelor's degree in English and business from Alabama A&M University. She has a master's degree in counseling from the University of Missouri St. Louis and an extensive education from life and the school of hard knocks. I can relate. Miss Rhonda Gray, take us away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is so funny. I, you never read really, like review your own bio. And then when I hear it, I was like, what was I thinking? <laughs> it's like I try to make all those dots connect, you know. 
of your resume. But thank you guys so much. And Shay, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a small group, so we'll keep it informal. And I'm going to make sure, like, if you see me veer off, that's because I'm looking at Catherine driving. So I'm going to make sure that I'm not saying anything that's going to cause her to be distracted or something. So um, Shay uh, asked me to, to share with you guys about diversity in business. And, you know, there's just... That that probably you know how every sort of decade or so there's like some something we go through in terms of like we're literally immersed in a movement. I remember when I was a consultant with St. Louis Public Schools, all I used to talk about and hear about was the achievement gap, right? And then we moved from the achievement gap to something else, and and now diversity, equity, and inclusion um, has really taken center stage. Um, not just in business, but just in, in our communities and as a social justice issue. And it's one of those things that uh, in the brief time we have here today, just know we're, we're not even, we're not even ready to scratch the surface. This is intended to be more of a, just a thought provoking sort of overview. And since we have a small group, we can kind of have a discussion about it. Um, but I wanted to just give you guys sort of three pointers today to frame and give you some context for how you look at diversity within your own businesses. Um, and so the first thing we'll talk about is what is diversity, equity, and inclusion. You often hear those terms used interchangeably. I used to actually use them interchangeably. Um, and I had to admit to myself, I remember for me when it became a bigger issue was when I was leading a nonprofit, Many funders would have a question on their grant applications. What are you doing to address diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I'm like, you know, my grant writer would always come to me and say, I don't know how to answer this. And it was, you could tell everybody was kind of floundering, just trying to figure out what they wanted to hear without really understanding what that meant and what we were doing. So first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll like try to get on the same page about what those, what those mean and what the distinctions are. And then also I have a few questions that I think every, whether business owner, organizational leader should ask themselves if they are wanting to really commit to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, you know, because there are people who, you know, they, they don't really have the commitment to it. It's just like sort of the, the, the thing to, to say or do. But if you really are committed, I think there are just a few questions you should ask yourself and then lastly, I want to talk about designing for DEI and what the missing E is in that equation, okay? So we'll, we'll just cover those three things quickly. Uh, I'll try to get through it and, um, and then leave some time for us to have questions or just a discussion about it. Does that sound okay? Great. So diversity is... It's so interesting to me because it, you know, it's it's it seems like it should be pretty straightforward, but I see how now it's kind of gotten watered down. But diversity is nothing more than the presence of a difference in a giving set it, setting. So, like, if all of us were on this call right now, and every single one of us had on a blue shirt, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's no diversity in our shirt. There's it's just all the same, and so people forget that the um, sort of the foundation in terms of, of what diversity is about is it's about differences. And those differences often uh, when, we, when we talk about it are referring to identities. So we think of differences in race, we think of differences in gender, uh, sexual orientation, religion, nationality, ethnicity. But anytime there is lack of a difference uh, in, in whatever identities or those things are, then you lack diversity. And then people often use the word diversity in a more general or ambiguous terms. Like how many of you guys have ever said or heard somebody say, we want to diversify our leadership team. We want to diversify our management team. Well, when a person says that when they use the, the sort of ambiguous general, general term of diversity, um, they, you can tell they really don't have an understanding because I think diversity calls for specificity. Rather than saying you want to diversify your leadership team, so we want a leadership team that includes more women, more people of color, uh, a person from this perspective, even a person from this geography, this age group. You have to be more specific when you start talking about diversity, otherwise you get caught in the trap 
of adding one thing or person that did you think, oh, now that makes it different. So one of the things that I would say first about diversity is understanding that it is about differences. And if you're going to look at it, focus on the specificity of the diversity you're talking about. Inclusion, the difference between inclusion and diversity, inclusion is about the people who have those identities, how those, um, how they feel in terms of how those differences are reflected. So people who reflect those different identities, do they feel uh, valued, feel welcomed, um, feel like they're being leveraged in, in a diverse setting? So you can have diversity and not have inclusion. You know, there's a, a leader in the DEI movement who I heard it from somebody at Edward Jones, but she said diversity is like being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. So if any of you guys ever been to a party where you just sit down waiting for somebody to <laughs> ask you to dance, holding your drink, <laughs> bobbing your head, that's the distinction. You can be in an environment and not feel welcome, not feel included, not feel like you're participating. And that's what inclusion is about. And inclusion is not a natural consequence of diversity. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people are making right now is they're focusing on these numbers around diversity. We got to get a diverse workforce. Well, if you don't have uh, an environment that supports that, you don't have inclusion because you just added a bunch of folks, a bunch of people that you think are different to a, a given situation without giving real thought to how do you create an experience that would really make those folks feel welcome. So um, inclusion, like I said, not a natural consequence of diversity has to be focused on intentionally outside of diversity. And then lastly, we have equity which is just taking an approach to ensure that everybody has access to the same opportunities. One of the most important things to me to remember about equity, and, and we learned this in the work I did, especially in nonprofit, is you have to recognize that advantages and barriers exist. And as a result, we all don't start from the same place. So Shay mentioned in my intro, I was executive director of Almost Home, and we serviced homeless, teenage, pregnant and parenting teenage girls and young women. So I'm talking between the ages of 12 and 30. So we were servicing young women who were coming out of homelessness, oftentimes who didn't have parents or families, uh, who didn't have support, uh, had been failed by the education system. A lot of them you know, needed to, to finish school, get GEDs. It would have been unreasonable for us to think that, oh, all you have to do is X, Y, Z. And that's, that's often how we do, because we view the world through our own values and our own personal experience. And, you know, and, we, and when, you're, when you're looking at how you can be equitable in either your business services, how you treat your customers, how you treat your employees, you've got to think, where is everybody starting from? And there's a great image of this online. I, I was going to pull it, but I didn't. But it shows the, the difference in equity. And it looks like some kids at, a, at a, a baseball game. And they're trying to look over the fence at the game. And, you know, they're different heights. And so they make adjustments and put a wooden box under the kid who's the shortest so that he can see the game. And that's not giving the kid an unfair advantage. It's just making it so that kids who have different heights can actually have the same experience. So that's what equity is about. So those are the distinction between those two. One's about identities and differences. One's about how people um, feel and experience the differences. And one is about acknowledging that those differences exist and that there are barriers that we have to um, sort of commit to making sure that everybody, at least um, we're addressing that imbalance. Does that make sense? Yeah, because that's the biggest thing. Now, I think when, you know, our, we have a lot of HR professionals in our organization and they're all, you know, we have consultants working on DEI and they were like, we, I've realized people don't even know what we're, we're talking about. So I wanted to start with that. And then I also think it's important to know what DEI is not. Please, please, please. It is not a charitable or philanthropic initiative. People think they're doing diversity. Now, it, it may very well fold into an overall social justice issue, 
but business owners who think they're treating that DEI like they would be treating a sponsorship of a golf tournament. Yeah, go, go ahead and do that so they can be quiet. You know, go ahead and do that so we look good. Go ahead and do that so we look socially conscious. That, that's not what is, it's not an initiative. It has to be something that is in, institutionalized and embedded within an organization. It has to be in the very soul and fiber of a business. It can't be like a one-time, one-off program. Uh, I'm a very strong believer in that you can't do a DEI training for two hours and think, that's it, we got it. It, it, just, it just doesn't make sense because it's rooted in so many of people's values and beliefs and unconscious biases. You do not change that in a two-hour training. It's, it's ongoing and it's evolving. And the last thing I would say is, you know, business owners don't like to hear this. You can't delegate DEI. It got to start from the top down. It's not, people think it's HR's job. I, I don't think it's HR's job because it's one of those things you know, where just like any other strategic business initiative, just like marketing is not one person's job. <laughs> it's like, because it, it, it's the overall experience that a customer has of a business, DEI can be HR's job. It has to start from the top down and HR can sort of lead the initiative, the efforts, the implementation of certain things, but the buy-in is critical from the top down if you wanna be successful. So questions you should ask yourself. You say this DEI thing is pretty big, you know, it's, it's this big monster, right? Because there's so much that it in, entails. The biggest thing it entails is, is dealing with people <laughs> as, as, as is every aspect of a business. But you got people from all different backgrounds, people from all different values, beliefs, and they're bringing all of that to the workplace. And so, to really focus on the DI efforts is to know that we're really gonna have to get down and dirty about like who, who we have on our team and what we're doing and what we're about. So some questions I would think, and I'm just gonna give you three, there's a lot more questions. The first one is why do you even wanna focus on diversity, equity, inclusion? And I mean that in the most respectful way. I tell people, look, if you are not serious about it, you know, you, it's almost like the, the Hippocratic Oath that medical doctors have to take is first do no harm. Don't start it if you're not serious about it, because you will ultimately end up doing harm. Because one of the things that if you are, if done properly, whether you bring in consultants or whomever, you're going to open up a can of worm in terms of people needing to be able to feel like they can trust each other and expose themselves and feel vulnerable and really, you know, it's messy work. So if you're not serious about it, I know it sounds crazy, but I tell people, don't even start, don't even say you're doing it. Just keep, keep the status quo, keep business as usual if you're okay with that. But if you're going to say you want to do DEI, I think you should ask yourself, why do I want to do it? You know, what is it ultimately that I hope to get out of this as a business owner and for my business? And then the second question would be, what is your vision for what your business or culture will look like when you become more diverse, equitable, and inclusive? Like, you got to have a picture in your mind. So it's back to that differences thing. If you walked in the office now and everybody was women and all the women had the same outfit on and they all had their hair the same way like you have to paint a picture of okay when this is done we're all going to have on different outfits to reflect our personalities we're going to get wear our hair in a different way and I know I'm sounding kind of shallow with this but it's women I'm just trying to give us something we can relate to you know we're all going to carry different purses like we're going to leverage and and really take advantage of the uniqueness and perspectives of everybody by not requiring everybody to be and think the same so you have to paint that picture, though, in your own mind of what that looks like. And once again, be specific. If it's all women, do you want 10% men? Do you want 20%? You know what I'm saying? Give it some number and some data so that you can measure your success and your progress and your effectiveness. And then lastly, are you willing to make the investment of time and resources to make the vision happen? You invest in sales, you invest in marketing. <laughs> I mean, you do. And people are your biggest investment, payroll, benefits, and all that. People are the biggest investment. It just makes sense that you have to 
invest um, in DEI. I'm actually on the board of directors of an organization and um, they asked me to head up the DEI committee they put in place. And I was really proud because the executive director said, listen, I'm putting a line item in the budget for this, Rhonda. What do you, what do you think we're looking at? Because they, they're just starting. But she's like, we got to put our money where our mouth is. You got a line item for everything else? You need to, there needs to be a line item for that, you know? Um, and and you, that varies depending on what you want to do. And so I would say that those are three questions. Why you want to do it? What's your vision? And are you willing to commit the time and resources? You know, when, if you can't get past those three questions, just put it on pause, give it a minute, say maybe not now, you know, but first do no harm. The last thing I want to talk about uh, is designing for DEI and what I call the missing E in DEI. So one of the biggest organizations, I mean, challenges organizations have is figuring out how to make that shift. Because ultimately what this is about is changing behavior, like any other initiative we do, any other, anything that happens in the workplace where you're trying to, whether you're trying to increase sales, increase your number of customers, it is about fundamentally, how do we get people to behave in such a way <laughs> that's going to help us deliver those results? Whether it's how you get your employees to behave a certain way, how do you get customers to behave and react a certain way? And so people have a, a real challenge in like, you know, how do we get that shift in behavior, particularly around making your DEI efforts successful? So I'm going to pose a question to you guys. I just want you to think about it with your business, your organization, is your organization, your business, is the culture currently producing the results that it is designed to produce? Is your organization, your business, your culture of it, pro currently producing the results that it is designed to produce? By sure, who would say yes? Raise your hand if you would say yes. Okay, all right. You guys are absolutely right. What happens is when people say they want change or want a certain outcome, they don't realize whatever game you're playing now is the game you're winning. Whatever your culture, whatever you're producing now, that's what you designed your culture, your business to produce however much sales you have, however many, you know, employees and how your employees perform and are acting, you have designed the current and existing environment to produce those results because design determines results. And the reason why I say that is to truly do DEI effectively, it's really fundamentally about a culture shift and I believe very strongly, and I believe strongly because I made huge mistakes in doing this, is that culture has to be designed. And I use the word designed intentionally. So when you think about whatever, uh, think about experiences that you had that have been just really mind blowing. And it could be something as simple as, you ever went to a restaurant and just the whole vibe was like everything from the overhead music to the lighting to the tablecloths. You're just like, it just added to your eating experience. And the food probably was great or whatever, but it was just this whole environment, this whole experience that really is what made it sort of world-class and pleasurable for you. That, that was intentionally designed. Everything from the music, from the tablecloths, from the way you were greeted by the hostess, that was in the design environment. And we're, we see that all the time in different settings. Um, and we don't realize that that has to be done for business. This is like showtime. You know, Disney World does it great. It's funny because I was shopping. I finally like, I'm venturing out to stores now. And I don't know if you guys, I noticed this. I went in Old Navy. Old Navy is always playing music to make you buy something. Because I didn't even go in there. I went in there to get one shirt <laughs> for my niece. But they were playing Motown. <laughs> I know I was pulling stuff off the rack. And I was like, they got me again. Because they get you in that happy place. Next thing you know, you spent more money than you intended to. They designed for that experience for the shopper. 
If you want a culture that reflects that diversity, that equity, and inclusion, you have literally got to step back from your business and think about like you Walt Disney or something and designing an experience like you would get at Disney World. Like, how are people acting? What are we saying? What is what is the environment, the physical environment look like? You know what I'm saying? Is it is it that everybody who is a owner and senior leadership or management, are they sitting in the penthouse and everybody else is sitting in cubicles down on the first floor? Like, what does it feel like? And so I use the word design intentionally. And I think that when you look at this, it's kind of a, a, a interesting and inspiring activity to step back and say, how can I design for the culture I want? You know, do we do, how do we want to interact? What do we want the vibe to be? Same like when you go into like a, a, a store or a restaurant. And then the last thing I'll say is, I tried to keep this under 15 minutes, is, um, there's really, a, a to me, a missing E in DEI, and it is empathy. And the reason I say that is because DEI, as I mentioned, is about people and people exploring their own sort of worldviews. And anytime you do that, it gets challenging. It gets messy because we we all have different worldviews. It's shaped by our own experiences. It's shaped by, you know, whatever sort of lens through which we're looking at the world. And that is, you know, often reflected from, I mean, or, or a result of our gender, our race, our geography, you know. Um, and so, in order to really have the conversations, you need empathy. What empathy, what I think people struggle with empathy, because people like to, that's also kind of a buzzword too now. And I think where people are getting tripped up with empathy is people oftentimes think empathy is about standing in someone's shoes and imagining how you would feel in their shoes. I learned particularly when my, I was working with nonprofits, I was faced every single day with some of the most tragic, horrific circumstances that human beings can be in. And I used to be like, oh man, you know, I it was trying to imagine what that might be, what it would be like if, if, if I was homeless, if I didn't have anywhere to go, if I had a baby and I was literally sleeping on, in a park on cold kind. So that is a part of empathy. Imagine how you would feel in a situation. But here's where you take empathy to the next level. And I think this is what's needed in DEI. It's not just imagining how you would feel in their situation. It's really about listening and getting a good understanding so you can imagine how they feel in that situation. It's not about, because see, when you make it about you, it becomes, it, it gets a little muddy. Because honestly, it was so painful for me to see a lot of the situation those girls was in. I didn't want to imagine myself homeless. And my experience was so far removed in that because I grew up in a home that and I never was even close to homelessness. So even trying to imagine me being in this situation, I could kind of push it away. Well, I'm not going to be homeless. I got too many friends and family. Somebody going to let me live with them. Like I was sort in my mind. I was already picturing I'm going to Shea House. If I ain't going to I ain't going to work. You know, it's like, that's what we do. If you, empathy really is about listening and understanding, which is what we did with our clients. And I was imagining what it was like for them to have to go through that. What is it like for you as a, as a teenager? What is it like for you as a homeless person? What you as an African-American woman? If you can't to try to get the understanding so you can see the from the person's eyes, then you only got half of empathy going. Because if you're just making it about you, it is not really empathy, okay? So I would say that if you can look at DEI, diversity in business, as a... Uh, as seriously as you would look at any other business initiative and take it as seriously as you would take any other business initiative and focus on those three questions, I think that you, you're not going to change it overnight, but I think you certainly get on the path to making some significant changes in, in what you want to do with your business. So with that, I'm going to get off my soapbox and we can talk and chat and y'all can challenge me 
Um, but I would love to hear your feedback and your perspectives with this, you know, in the time we have left. I hope I didn't go over Shay. I'm sorry, I was looking at the clock. I'm good? Okay. I have a question. I'm gonna jump right in. Okay, Lisa. Okay, so I work, I'm the event coordinator at the Child Center here in Wentzville. We're a nonprofit. We're a okay. Child Center. Um, so we provide intervention and prevention for children and families who have been victims of abuse. Lisa Payton and Angie sit on our board of directors. Um, and so interesting, I'm so excited to, to hear you today. And I want to talk offline with you a little bit too, because we have our accreditation coming up. And part of that is having to, like you said, like what are our numbers, you know, for that, you know, accreditation. We decided to take it a step further and we created some focus groups. So I'm in a focus group that is made up of myself and HR and then some people from prevention, some people from services. So we've got a diverse group there, of people that are working in different areas to come up and decide, are we treating, like, who, are we giving the appropriate services to the community that we're serving? Because we serve a huge population, 14 counties. Wow. And we service St. Charles County, which is St. Charles County, but we're also very rural up towards the Iowa border. So that, those experiences up there in Iowa are gonna be different than they are here in St. Charles County. Mm -hmm. So we all came to like, what are some of the people that we're serving that we're probably not really reaching? And so it started out as we were gonna do this because of accreditation. And, but then we decided we're really doing ourselves a disservice if we just one and done this for accreditation. And we as a focus group don't implement what we want to do for, from going forward. Because if we, we, if we just drop it here to accreditation and then in two years we're doing strategic planning and we start talking about it again then and we don't do anything for two years, then we have, we've done nothing, like you said. Right. Um, so I was really happy to hear all those things you said because we, we are trying really hard to figure out how can we and what can we do to make sure that we are doing that for our population that we serve. Mm -hmm. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'd really like to talk to you offline a little bit about possibly doing a DEI training because that is part of it. We did a um, training with Lindenwood just on um, like the LBGTQ community and stuff like that. And that was great, but it's again, you can't learn it in an hour or two hours and three hours and then start using it in your daily life. Mm -hmm. so we want to keep continuing to provide training and actually have really meaningful training that's not all 25 of us maybe on a Zoom call, but some smaller interactive workshop type things that we can actually have conversation because I feel like we feel like that's going to be the best. We yeah. have space to ask questions because you really are wanting to learn and, and wanting to provide service for our community. Yeah. Um, that's one part. And then mm -hmm. the second question has come up in, in our focus group lately, because I feel like we've transitioned from trying to be really aware of people of color and are we serving people of color? Are we serving the LBGTQ community? You know, what are we doing to make sure that we're being, you know, including everyone being inclusive and that we, implicit biases aren't happening and all of those things. And then it's changed to with the diversity question. We've all noticed in the focus group as of late that where you were saying you need a diverse population, where some of the populations that were diverse are now going in like, nope, you can't be part of this group. And one of the questions that came up was some high schools and some colleges are providing space for their uh, people of color and there's no one else is included to come into that. So how do we handle that situation? And how is that really diversity? Yeah, I, you know what? That that's first of all, I'm happy to talk to you offline because you guys got some specific that you're working on, and and I'm 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 okay with uh, us having a conversation about that. I will say this: I think I, I heard a couple things, and so I now it just like generates questions in my mind. But you know, this whole notion of tr trying to um, create diversity like you got all of saying this this area is only for people of color that's when that's when DEI gets it's misguided 
because that's not, <laughs> that's why I said the operative word is differences. So if all you're going to do is take people who are in a minority and say, this is only for you all, you don't have diversity, you know, but, but I think I, I don't, you know, I don't judge because I think the efforts sometimes are well meant, meant and well intentioned and it's just misguided because people don't get it. Um, what I would say, what came to mind as you were talking about your efforts in the focus group, I'm curious and I would be curious to know, do you guys have uh, a, a good reflection of your client population, who you're talking to? And well, because I see, I, I, would, I would think it starts from there. And, and, and we can talk more specifically offline, but here's why I say that. I, you know, I used to be the, the, the queen of like, let's do a focus group. Let's do, we did focus groups before we did strategic planning and we would do, and they would, and I had a consultant, we talked to donors, we talked to volunteers, we talked to board members, uh, funders. Guess what? I said, why is nobody talking to these clients? They are the ones who we are serving. And when we're talking about trying to create a transformational life experience for them, you're trying to take somebody from homelessness to being educated and employed and self-sufficient, that's a whole transformation. And yet they weren't involved in the conversation. So I put them at the center of the conversation. I put them in terms of how we design programs, how we looked at the work, because it was their experience that we were trying to shape. And then the focus groups became secondary because focus groups, at best only add incremental improvement to what you do. You ever been in a focus group and everybody's like, we gonna brainstorm here, we gonna get your feedback and brainstorm. And it ends up being just like the, the 1.5, 2.0 version of what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're really trying to create a new experience and dynamics for your organization, for your clients, you gotta start with, okay, what is it like? Well, how are you currently experiencing us? What is this? What is this like for you? How easy is it to register? How easy is it to 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 um, you know apply if you have to do that? You want to see that as like a customer value chain, almost. You know how you have a supply chain with like your product. There's a customer value chain where they go from the time they hear about you to the time they exit your program or your business. What is every step that they go through? And you want to get their perspective. Because one of the things that we heard, for instance, and, and, and Lisa, you guys, I can, I can imagine that population. But the girls would say, you know, when we call, we automatically felt like we got treated like, you know, something was wrong with us, like we had done something wrong. And that wasn't intentional, but it's because you, the, the intake specialist got a worksheet with questions. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you call, it would be like calling your doctor's office and you in pain and you hurting and they pick up the phone and said, uh, what, okay, well, is it a bump on your left leg? Is your head hurting? Does your stomach feel funny? You're just like, this person don't sound like they care about me. They just going through a checklist. Right. So you have to get that perspective to me first, and then you funnel that into focus groups to say, here's all this information and data we've gotten. We now need to get real honest with ourselves about what are we doing to create this? What are the barriers? And then you can start the focus group conversation. But oh, yeah, yeah that, that, you guys, kudos to you though for starting and saying we're not just doing it for accreditation because that's what most people do. Yeah. I'll <laughs> email you offline though to talk about some things. Gotcha. So I um I love what I I'm not on I'm sparing you guys I'm in grandma time so I'm not coming on camera but when you were just <laughs> talking about um the accreditation and stuff Lisa what what jumped into my mind and making sure we're serving those other counties is that in St. Charles County we have a very you I feel like we have a very unique culture we have a lot of great leadership just with it just people that we know um, who support the child center. And so we have tons of advocacy because that's kind of part of the culture in this county. That's what I see, which, so when I think of diversity, what we have here in St. Charles County is not the same as maybe what they have in Lincoln County or Warren County. And so I think of it more in terms of just that, that culture, you know, right. whatever that community culture is in general, uh, whether it includes differences in race or religion or not, there is a culture. 
um, that is very unique here. And, and so then back to what you just said, um, Delane, about talking to that, those people, that's how you get into those communities is finding out those people. Cause I know that, you know, with the child center has struggled with certain communities because they've been resistant. And so I think what you just said would be a really very helpful in terms of breaking down those barriers. Um, yeah, we could probably get permission from some of our former families. That's part of the problem too, Rhonda, is we don't really have contact. Mm -hmm. After they leave here, we're not, they're in, sometimes in touch with their advocate and maybe a therapist, but once they're, you know, out of our, our care, we don't have contact with them again, usually unless they have to come back and see us again, which obviously we don't want them to have to do. Right. But we do have a group of amazing um parents, caregivers, family members of victims who still support us behind the scenes. They don't necessarily want to be in, you know, in front of the scenes, but behind the scenes who we could probably ask some of those questions to. Mm -hmm. What was your experience when you called in? What was your experience like when you came and saw the, you know, child and family, you know, um, person, counselor at the desk? You know, what was your conversation like with your advocate, you know? Obviously, we try to be as caring as we can here. There, you know, and we want anybody to bring them here first, so that we kind of limit those sterile question kind of situations with Children's Division. No offense to Children's Division or law right. enforcement, but we want them to come here so that there is that more kind of we want to bring you in and and give you as much compassion as we're legally able to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that's a great idea to somehow get that because we can only ask so many questions on a questionnaire. We're not allowed to ask some other questions just because of the prosecutorial process of it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it would be really great to get the feedback from just their experience. To, I mean, we do ask them a, some follow-up questions, but maybe given like some time away from it, like not right away after right. they did it, maybe we could contact somebody from six months ago and say, hey, we just wanted to follow up and ask you a few questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. No, absolutely. And, you know, even that, that can be sometimes challenging in terms of, because, you know, depending on how you track clients or who you're working with. Um, but, you know, we really, we, we made an effort and I know they're still doing it. I, I almost home is actually one of my clients now after I left, but I, I still uh, talk to the ED uh, all the time and, you know, staying in touch with the clients. And interestingly enough, I also talked to what I consider non-consumers of our service. So there were girls who needed it, needed the service, but refused to come and get help. And I wanted to know why you, why, why what is it? Because their perceptions of what we did and who we were and why they, you know, and they would say, I, I don't want to, I don't, they, it was a stigma. Who wants to feel like they, even though it was transitional housing, it was nice. It didn't look like a shelter. It did they were like, I don't want to be seen as somebody who had to live in a shelter. I didn't want it, you know, so we took signage off the door. We made sure it just looked like a house so that people didn't feel. So it's, you can get a lot too from the people who are eligible for your services, but choose not to, to, to take, take advantage of them. Good point. Thank you so much. No problem. Other ideas, profound thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Well, I have a I have a nine thirty, but I'm happy to stay on here with you guys because <laughs> my my nine thirty is with my district manager now. <laughs> that meeting won't be as warm and friendly as this meeting, so I I need an excuse to not go. But um, uh, no, do you guys? If you know, I really want to thank you guys for having me. I hope, like I said, I, in a half an hour, I can't do this topic justice. And I thought I'd just plant some seeds. Uh, I'll leave it up to you guys to water them and let them grow as they will. But I'm happy to come back and or happy to continue this conversation in some way. So. Lisa, I'll, I'll, I can put either my information in the chat or I can get it to Shay. I don't know if you guys have a mailing list so she can get it out. Get it to Shay, then she can get it to me because we're on the committee together. So that'll be great. Okay, awesome. Yes, awesome. yes thank you, Ms. Rhonda, very much. And um, 
Let's see, Catherine to the Moon Marketing said, thank you, Rhonda, very much. This was very, very informative. Thank you for breaking down the definitions and just dumbing it down to its simplest form so we can repeat it and really hone in on it. Empathy, you see, I've got like a, I got like a whole page full of notes. <laughs> just, you know, just the definition of, of empathy and, you know, imagining how they would feel, you know, that's a, that's a clarity check right there in itself. <laughs> Um, so thank you so very much. I'll make sure that this group gets the information. We appreciate you. Everybody have a blessed day. Enjoy your week. Thanks, thank Rhonda. you. Bye, thank guys. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for hosting, Shay. <laughs>